complicated. Has dedicated this week for Christian home and marriages. The theme of the family ministries all over the world is um, I will go with my family. And for this week, the focus is on family resilience. The United African SEA Church Family Ministry is very grateful to Pastor Emmanuel Alba and his administration for making this week available to us and for leading us to our awesome speaker this evening. We will be learning about families that overcome. I pray that the good Lord will take away every distraction and that he will bring people to hear this message that the Lord has prepared for us this evening. I pray that we will obey and let the message do what it's supposed to do in our lives. And just a little housekeeping for the evening. I know it's a prayer meeting, it's midweek prayer, but for today, we will take away our prayer request. There will be time for intercessory prayer where all our needs, all our family needs, all the issues that are pressing on us will be taken up to God in prayer. But for this evening, during the time that we usually will do um, our prayer requests and testimonies, we will just dedicate, <coughs> excuse me, for question and answers. So get your questions ready um, and just put them on the chart or just hold them when it's question and answer time, you will unmute yourself and we, you will be given time to ask questions. On that note, we will go ahead and close our eyes and get permission from our Lord before we start this evening. Let us pray. Gracious Father in heaven, we are so happy that you are a God that we can call our Father, which are in heaven. Father Lord, we are here because we are in need of your presence in our families. You have blessed us with a speaker this evening. You have brought us from all our works in our families. And it is time for you to transform our lives. So Lord Jesus, please allow us to open our eyes and our minds that we may behold all the wondrous things that you have for us this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 We, will, we will listen as Elder and Sister Youngblood bless us with the opening hymn this evening. Thank you. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let its praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of Christ, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises I cannot fail. When the howling storms of doubt and fears are sail. By the living word of God, I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. 
standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming worthy with the spirit sword, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, Standing on the promises of Christ, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ella and sister, for blessing us with your voices this evening. It is time for our Bible text, and we will take our text from the gospel according to John chapter 16, verse 33, 16, John 16, verse 33, it says, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Okay. May the good Lord bless the reading, the hearing, and the obedience to this word. Amen. Amen. It is time now for me to introduce our speaker of the hour. Such a privilege to uh, welcome our speaker. Mrs. Tineke Fawale. It is my privilege and honor to have spoken with you and to have had a little good time with you over the phone. And I'm glad that she made it here and you're here to bless us. Thank you for coming to introduce Sister Fawale. She wants to be called by Sister Tineke. <laughs> She has been happily married to her college sweetheart, Alaba, for 36 and a half years. And their union is blessed with children and grandchildren. They have been in family ministry for over 20 years. And under the auspices of Optimum Families, they assist couples to enjoy and thrive in their relationships while empowering parents to raise well-rounded children who are happy, healthy, and highly successful. <clears throat> Sister Tineke is an international speaker and relationship coach. She is the host of the YouTube channel, Optimum Families, where she addresses parenting issues specific to immigrant families and help bridge the cultural and generational gap between parents and children. She is actively involved in her church and community and does speaking, workshops, and seminars for various organizations. Satiniki is a criminal and child welfare law attorney and passionately advocates for her clients in the criminal justice system. She is the author of the book, Master of My Destiny, a contributing author of the books, Faith Requires Action in ELLD, and currently working on her next book, When Cultures Collide. Sister Tineke is passionate about helping immigrant families. She believes that under the right circumstances and utilizing the appropriate tools and strategies, every child can succeed and every marriage can thrive. She strongly believes that what God has done for her family and other families she has helped, he can do it for everyone else. We are going to listen to a song by video. And at the end of that show song, the next voice we will hear 
we will be the beautiful voice of our sister, Sister Tineke Fawale. You're welcome. Thank you. Amen. 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 Good evening, everyone. Thank you Good so evening. much, first of all, for that beautiful song. It's actually <laughs> one of my favorite songs. So that's, I'm so happy about that. I want to thank, thank Pastor Abba, uh, the leadership of uh, this church and um, the family ministries leaders, brother and sister Emo, for considering me to come here this evening. I'm really grateful. And I bring greetings from the Nigerian Seventh-day Adventist Church in Atlanta. We are actually having our own program also going on right now. So I thank God for being a part of this family of God all over the world this week. We're celebrating the Christian Home and Marriage Week. And I'm glad that Houston Church is also a part of that. And as Sister Imo said, the theme this year is Resilient Families. That means families that bounce back after adversity. And the topic that I've chosen for this evening is families that overcome. Families that overcome. We know what we've all gone through, this pandemic, and it has affected everyone, even including our children. You know, we can't hide away the mask from them and 
even some of them have experienced personal things, maybe things that happen to their friends, their friends, families, their teachers. So all of us are involved. But while I was preparing for this, I was just thinking about it, that the pandemic is not the only adversity that we face. Sickness has not stopped. People have not stopped dying of cancer. They haven't stopped dying of a stroke. Car crashes have not stopped. Gun violence has not stopped. So this world is just full of challenges. And as Christians, we need to be prepared and in the offensive all the time, knowing that this is going to happen. And um, in, in the text that we read, John 16, 33, Jesus said, I have told you these things so that in me you have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So it's almost a promise that we are going to have trouble in this world. But we thank God because he has promised us that he will overcome. And once we are his children and he overcomes, then we also overcome. So today our discussion is gonna be in four parts. We're gonna talk about characteristics of overcoming in our individual lives. Secondly, in our marriages. Thirdly, in our families, including parents and children. And finally, in the family of God, even as we just sang. So let us pray as we invite the Holy Spirit to teach us tonight. Our Father, in the name of Jesus, we want to thank you so much for this opportunity that you have given us to have this uh, uh, knowledge again and to know more about how to uh, be resilient, oh Lord, even as families. Father, I'm asking, oh Lord, that you will speak to my heart, that you will fill me with the Holy Spirit, that I will not speak of my own, but as you will direct me. Father, anything that I have prepared that you do not wish me to say, I pray, Father, that I will not say it. And Father, Lord, anything that you want your children to hear, that we will all hear it and that this will all transform our lives for the better. And after we have heard, I pray, Father, that we'll not be hearers alone, but doers of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So talking about overcoming adversity, how do we overcome adversity? How do we become resilient to the troubles that plague us as individuals? And I'm going to start with a personal story. So a few years ago, well, it's been, my daughter is going to be 27 years in April. And it was when she was a baby that I was diagnosed with end-stage renal disease. And I always used to just be so worried that what is going to happen? This child, who's going to raise her? When am I going to die? How long am I going to live? And I used to almost become depressed until something happened. A woman that we know very well that was our friend, she was driving in her subdivision and she had an accident and died. And then she was a nurse. So there was a doctor that was working in the same hospital that began to make collection for her children. And one week after, this doctor died of a brain aneurysm. And, you know, the Holy Spirit just spoke to me and said, you know what, Sinuke, whether or not anyone is going to die has nothing to do with whether or not they are sick. These two people were not ill and now they are dead. So you have to know that every moment is what everyone has. We all have just this moment. Now, what's going to happen the next moment? Who's going to be the one to die next moment? None of us knows. And so just stop worrying yourself about this and just concentrate on this moment. And what that did was it made me begin to appreciate and be grateful for every moment. So for my children, every achievement. So if someone finished elementary school, oh my goodness, I'm still here. College, oh wow. And then our children started getting married. My goodness, I'm still here. So it just made me appreciate every moment and became very, very grateful, not taking anything for granted. And that's the first thing that I think when we are grateful to God for what he has done for us, it helps us to be able to manage whatever difficulties we have. And so I will encourage all of us every day. This is what I do. Every day, you have a gratitude diary and write three to five things that you are grateful for that particular day. There's just a way that being grateful helps us to be able to deal with whatever it is that happens outside. No matter what it is, we can face it because we just have this filled heart of gratitude. 
And the next things that I'm going to talk about how we can have resilience, even as individuals, is going to come from the story of Joseph. I just feel this is just one of the most powerful stories in the Bible about someone coming out of adversity and thriving. I think Joseph is the embodiment of an overcomer. He left home at 17, we all know, not by his own will. And I don't know if we have young people here today so that they can relate. He was thrown to an unknown land. It's like a 17 year old being removed from the United States and taken to China, where you don't even speak the language. So Joseph was thrown to Egypt, no parents, no brother or sister, no friends, no church members. I can't even imagine how someone can deal with that. But he was there. And while he was there, he continued to be the child of God that he was. So much so that he was able to rebuff the advances of Potiphar's wife. But then that got him in trouble. He was obeying God's will. And then he was put in jail unjustly. So that's like the second horrible thing that happened to him. And then when he got to jail, he was able to help two people, the butler and the baker, to interpret their dreams. The butler was released and promised Joseph that he was going to remember him. He didn't. He forgot all about Joseph. That was enough reason for anyone to be bitter, for anyone to be angry and turn against God. But he did not. He remained connected to God. And that is the next point that I want to bring out. When we are facing adversity, it's not the time to stop going to church. It's not the time to get angry at God. But that is the time to have a connection with God. Because I'm thinking about it. What else could have sustained Joseph? He didn't have a Bible with him because all he went to do was to give food to his brothers on the field. So he didn't have his Bible with him. So he, he didn't have church. He didn't have anywhere to fellowship. But he, I think that even developed his personal relationship with God. That you know what? God is the only one that I have. I'm sure he must have been fervent in his personal Bible study and prayer because there was no one there to support him. And that's the same thing we have to do. When we are going through hard time, that's when we need to study the Bible more. That's when we need to read the Bible. That's, when we, that's the time we need to begin to pray. Another thing, as we all know about the story of Joseph, is that he maintained his integrity and excellence even when he wasn't rewarded because it was a good thing that he obeyed God and didn't... Uh, fall for the advances of Potiphar's wife, but that landed him in jail. But he still was not discouraged. He was not discouraged. He continued to be who he was. And then another thing was that he kept loving and caring and serving. Remember, the Bible says he saw the butler and the baker very sad and dejected. And he went to them, what's wrong? How can I help you? And then they told him about the dreams they had. And he interpreted those dreams for them. So even in our adversity, when we can have the grace to still reach out to other people, to not only be consumed with what we are going through, but to continue to love others and serve others, our spirits are lifted up. Another thing is that Joseph remained hopeful. He remained hopeful. As I said, he didn't turn against God. Eventually, uh, the butler remembered him when Pharaoh had a dream that he needed interpretation for. They remembered him and he, 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 he answered the call. And I think the most important characteristic of, Joe, um, of Joseph is that he chose forgiveness over revenge. Many times the adversities that come upon us stem from what other people do to us. I was fired from a job before. And I was very bitter because I felt, no, th these people should not have done this to me. For all that I've put in this place, I should not have received this. It had to take, I had to actually ask God to please help me to let it go and not continue to feel this way about other people. And it's the same for us. Whatever we are going through, sometimes adversity is a good propeller to greater things. Remember that Joseph, it was from jail that he met the people that introduced him to Pharaoh and eventually became the prime minister of Egypt. And also he had a wonderful attitude through it all. Remember when he eventually saw his brothers again and he said, what you meant for evil, 
God meant it for good. So I'm not even going to be upset with you. It is only the grace of God that can help us do that. And I pray that even as we go through our individual challenges, that the Lord will give us the grace to be able to have these attributes because they can only serve to make us overcomers. They can only serve to give us a reward just the same way that Joseph was rewarded. And the part two is, how do we overcome in our marriages? And I truly believe that regardless of what our marriages look like right now, we can have the love, we can have the joy, we can have the peace, we can have the beauty that we always had. Because according to Philippians 4.13, the Bible says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So now we are going to go through what are the characteristics of an overcoming marriage. And of course, if we are going to have a seminar on marriage, you know, it can take a whole weekend. So I'm just going to touch on just a few things. Just in my husband and I counseling young couples, especially, we run across this a lot. People in overcoming marriages take responsibility and they don't do the blame game. What we see most of the time, you know, they come in and the wife is just like, you know, he did it, he did it, he did it. Everything is about what he did. And he comes in, she did, she did. And the first thing we always tell them is, forget about your spouse. Just look inward for a second. How, in what way have I contributed to this? What did I even do that's not right? And I think that's the very first thing. When we can look inward, then we can begin to make the changes that we need to make. The second characteristic of an overcoming marriage is that they recognize that they are a team. If the Bible can say that the disciples and the Acts of Apostles had everything in common, then I don't know why as husbands and wife, we cannot have anything in common. And that even among us as Christians that we are boasting, you know, I'm the one that's making the money and all of that, putting down our spouses. Whereas everything that we have, every opportunity that we have, have been given to us by God. And when couples are a team, they are able to weather adversity better. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter four, verses nine to 12, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Unfortunately, there are a lot of people who are in marriages, but they are alone. They are weathering the storms of life alone. Whether it's financial difficulty, whether it's sickness, they are doing it alone, even though they are married. That's not the plan of God. And we cannot overcome that way. And I don't want to be a prophet of doom, but we have seen a lot of situations where the spouse that has been lauding it, that has been saying, I make this and that, where either they have fallen ill and then the other spouse that you have been condemning is the one that now has to rise up. Or, or sometimes, you know, people have passed away. We have seen it. And sometimes it looks like we forget that we are human. We forget our mortality when we make all these threats. There's a very sad story. Um, some of you may know this couple because they were in New York before they moved back to Nigeria. And um, it was a situation where the wife was a doctor and all their friends, everybody knew how she threw it in her husband's face, you know, how she let him know that she was the breadwinner and all of this, and it was so bad. And then unfortunately one time, I think they had a son that was kind of emotionally deranged and he went and hit his brother and actually killed his brother. The mother rushed in to see what was going on. And, and actually, we also heard that the man had been telling this, his wife that they needed to do something. They needed, and she was saying, well, I'm the doctor. Nothing is wrong with him. And that this boy actually hit his mom and she, she didn't die, but she, she had brain damage so much so that she kind of became a vegetable. She couldn't walk anymore, she couldn't do anything. The man at some point now decided, you know, they needed to go to Nigeria, things would be better for them. They went to Nigeria and the man took another wife. He still had his wife at home, 
but she doesn't know anything that's going on around her and he took on another wife. I know that is an extreme situation, but I said that so we can always remember that we are only human and that whatever we have is to be shared even between us and the spouses. The third characteristic of overcoming marriage is that they choose to thrive and not just survive. There are so many people who are counting decades. We've been married 30 years, but it's 30 years of misery, 30 years of you doing your own thing, I'm doing my own thing. But you can choose to thrive. The mantra of my husband and I is, if you're gonna be married, just enjoy it. Don't just say you are married. And honestly, when we go for weddings, you know how newlyweds, the husband and wife are just looking at each other's eyes. I thank God that at this point, it wasn't always like that. My husband and I were not always where we are. But right now, even after 36 years of marriage, I like the fact that when I go for weddings, I also can look at my husband's eyes right next to me and say, wow, I still love you. So that is what God can do for our marriages. Maybe when we were seven, 10 years into the marriage, I wouldn't even say that. I wouldn't say that my husband was my friend, but God has worked in our lives. But it takes some things to get to the point where your marriage is thriving and not just surviving and that it will continue to thrive even in the face of anxiety. And I'm just going to mention a few things. Humility. Nobody can thrive and enjoy in their marriage without humility. And you just need to think about Christ, the creator of heaven and earth, coming to die for us, coming to be treated anyhow by the, by the works of his hands. And as the Bible says, sub, submitting himself unto death, even the death on the cross. When we think about the humility of Christ, then what is it that we cannot be humble with our spouses and be humble enough and be vulnerable enough to say, I'm sorry, and to just you know, esteem others better than ourselves, as the Bible says. Quick to forgive. And again, that is one thing that I can point out that has really helped my husband and I. It used to be that when we were mad at each other, we will remain in anger and just not ready to give in. But now we look at the fact that it's only the two of us at home. How many more years do we have to live that we are just going to fight and you know not want to resolve it? So now, no matter how any how anyone feels, you know, maybe I feel that you know when my husband did something, said something that I don't like, I just <laughs> talk to myself to get over it. And, you know, and move on and resolve so that we can be laughing the next minute. And he too is having the same mind that, you know, we don't need to let things drag because there's no way that you can avoid conflict when you're in a marriage relationship. But you can determine that I'm not going to hold on to this. We have so many years ahead that we want to enjoy. I'm not going to do that. And these couples who choose to thrive instead of just surviving also know when to seek help. They know when to seek professional help. There are too many people that we speak with that are hurting in their marriages, but they are insisting, we don't want to tell anyone about our problems. We don't want to tell anyone about our problems. But then it gets to the point where they cannot handle it anymore. And then when you divorce, the whole world knows that so-and-so have divorced. So if we are going to thrive in our marriages, we need to know when to seek help. We need to, or maybe we're in a support group. In Atlanta here, we have a monthly marriage enrichment group it's on zoom you know i'm inviting you if you want to join every month right now we are reading a book and there's no expert we all just come together somebody a couple has the assignment to read the book and we all discuss it and it has been helping our marriages as a matter of fact one woman recently shared a testimony she said before she started attending she and her two friends were praying about their marriages they were praying for breakthroughs she said now I have a breakthrough in my marriage and my two friends are still on their knees because the Bible says my people perish for lack of knowledge. It didn't even say my people perish for lack of prayer. So we can pray, but when God has given us knowledge to be able to do some things, God expects that we will do that. And then yearly marriage retreats. This is really where my husband and I got help. We've been attending an annual marriage retreat for 18 years. And this year is due on Friday. So this Friday, we are going for the weekend. That's, that is the gift that we give to ourselves once a year. And we learn so much there all the time. And it truly 
transformed our marriage. So I will implore us. It's not even only for people that have problems. Now we go every year. We're going to continue to go by the grace of God. You know, no matter how well we are doing, we will go. So we all need to oil our relationships and we will thrive rather than just surviving. And then number four that we can do in marriage is to follow God's assignment of duties. You know, the Bible says in Ephesians 5.22, wives, submit yourselves to your own husband as, to the, as unto the Lord. And verse 25 says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Just like me, I know that many of you have heard these verses forever and ever and ever. But when we started reading this book this year, it actually enlightened me in ways that I never knew about these verses. And I'm going to share it with you. When God tells husbands, love your wives, as Christ loved the church, he has actually put a need in us women to be loved. And when he says, wives, submit yourself to your own husband, it is God himself that put the need in our men to be respected. It's God put it there. It's God himself that put it there. And people usually ask, well, what if he doesn't deserve me to respect him? What if she doesn't deserve me to love him? And God gave us the answer again in the Bible. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1, the Bible says, wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. So God is saying, even when that man is undeserving, even when that man doesn't believe, you submit so that they may be won over that way. So it's, it's not, does he deserve it? He is to be given because God has put the need. And so when men don't have respect, it's like you have just thrown a truck over them. By the same token for women, remember the story of Goma in Hosea. God told Hosea, go after her. Goma was sleeping all over the streets, committing adultery. <laughs> but God said, Goma, that's your, uh, uh, Hosea, that's your wife. Go after her. God commanded Hosea to go and love this unlovable wife. What man wants his wife to be sleeping all around? But God said, go and love her because he is the one that put in our, they put the need in us to be loved. So husbands, if you have a wife and you know, she wants you to say, I love you. She wants you to put your arms around her. She wants you to be affectionate. And you just say, oh, no, 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 no. I don't want to do that. You are really denying her of a need that God has put there. And by the same token for women, when we disrespect our husband, we are touching on a nerve and we are not providing what God himself has put there as a need. That was the revelation to me. I always prided myself that, oh, I'm very respectful to my husband. But when we started reading that book, it's called Love and Respect by Emerson Egregious. When I started reading that, I was like, wow, <laughs> I have a lot to do. So that is for our marriages. Now, this, the third part is overcoming in our families. Remember, the theme is I will go with my family. We all need our families. We cannot go this alone. So as it relates to our families, the first thing that I want to say, it might be counterintuitive, but it's actually self-care, that we take care of ourselves, especially busy uh, parents of young children. If you don't take care of yourself, you are not able to serve your family from a good place. Maybe you'll be murmuring and complaining all the time, but if you have taken care of yourself, if you do something that you love from time to time, something that uh, relaxes you, something that refreshes you, like maybe reading a book, maybe even talking on a phone to a friend, maybe listening to good music, do something that refreshes you from time to time. And then you are energized and you are in a good place to be able to serve your children and your family. And what is healthy, you know, exercising, lots of water, things like that. Because if you are a, if you are an unhappy person, if you are not a satisfied person, 
you cannot minister to your spouse or your children or your family. Number two, make parenting a team effort. So whatever it is, do the chores together, whether it's the dishes, the cooking, changing the diaper, whatever it is, do everything together. Because all those things are, come to play even when we have difficulties because we have been strengthened in those areas because we are together in doing what they do. They go a long way in helping us. Number three, have a family altar. And I know that we all know what, is, what devotion is, but honestly, there are a lot of people that don't do it. People say, I'm so busy. Our schedules won't allow. We don't have the same schedule. If we are too busy to have family devotion, then we are too busy. And when we say family devotion, we're not talking about just checking the box. Oh, we had devotion today. We're talking about meaningful, something that's meaningful to our children, something that they can enjoy, something that they look forward to. So we have to find age appropriate materials for our children, not trying to use uh, your own adult devotional and reading to them. Not when they are tired. We want to have them in mind that we want this to be something that they enjoy. And do something for us. When our children were growing up, every morning, we didn't have much time because they were going to school. In the evening, we would have more time, you know, spend, you know, maybe 45 minutes. In the morning, maybe just 15 minutes to 20 minutes. But I remember we had a family creed that we will read. Um, I'll give you an example. I encourage us to do this, especially during these times, the pandemic and just adversity going on, school shootings, so many things going on. We need to fortify our children with the word of God. So we put together some scriptures of promises of different things. And we sat together, we will read together before they went to school. So we were surprised that after three weeks, we all did not need our scripts anymore. Everybody was just able to, uh, to, to read it by heart. And I truly believe that reading the word of God every day then has something to do with how he has even blessed our children and helped them to remain in him. Because the, the Bible says the word of God would not return to him void. So it actually did something in their lives. So ours was, you can make up your own. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Behold, I am for signs and for wonders in this land and wherever I go. I'm being trained in the way I should go. When I'm old, I will not depart from it in Jesus' name. I am taught of the Lord and great shall be my peace. No weapon that is formed against me shall prosper. Every tongue that shall rise against me in judgment, I shall condemn. And finally, I'm just skimming through. I'm not reading everything. The last is, but we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that we may show forth the praises of him who have called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And we will explain to them that you are a chosen generation. So don't come here and be telling us, oh, some other people are doing that. Why can't we do it too? No, you are a chosen generation. Another thing that we do as families, even to be able to be resilient against the things that come at us is to openly share our struggles and our testimonies with our children. The Bible tells us in Psalm 78, verses three through seven, things we have heard and known, things our ancestors have told us, we will not hide them from our children. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power, the wonders that he has done. So the next generation will know about them, even children yet to be born. And they in turn will tell their children so that they can put their trust in God and not forget his deeds, but keep his commandments. You see, some of us, when we have issues, we, we, we hide it from our children. Our children need to know our struggles so that when the answers come, they can also know that God answers prayers. You know, I remember when I had my kidney transplant that it was so gratifying. I think my oldest at that time was in eighth grade. When I came out, and I came out of surgery and came into my room, my children had had scripture that they had pasted all over the wall. And that really encouraged me. And that is from just them knowing, you know, passing the word of God to them, letting them know the importance of prayer and all of that. And that leads me to keeping a family praise journal. Every family should have a praise journal. You know, as human beings, we forget God's blessings. 
We forget what he did yesterday. So when trouble comes today, we are so frazzled. How is God going to handle this? But if we keep a praise journal, we can always go back and see, wow, if God did this last time, then he's going to do it again. Then have time to play and have fun with your family. There's a way that that also helps us even to be able to deal with adversity. You know, have a family fun night. I remember when our children were growing up, we had a family fun night. It was Monday night. And once a week, somebody will be the one to choose the activity. So I love board games. So mine will always be board games. So the whole family will play with me. Next Monday, it will be someone else's turn to choose their activity. Somebody may say, I want us to watch a movie together. Then we watch a movie together. We found out that our children loved it so much. It meant so much to them that our, that our parents have time for us to just sit together and have fun. You know, family that prays together stays together and a family that plays together also stays together. And then know your children, listen to them and nurture them. I know that, you know, as Africans, you know, we know to do that physically. We nurture our children. Academically, we make sure that they are doing well. Spiritually, we make sure that they are doing well. One area where we are lacking is the emotional, nurturing our children emotionally, especially our men. Maybe women do a better job of nurturing our children emotionally, but men, we need you to be more in tune even with your children's emotions. When we talk to young people, they complain that, you know, maybe have, in fact, one, one, somebody had something that he said was causing a lot of pain. I'm guessing that maybe it was sickle cell. And that the parents will still be saying, oh, you're just, uh, you just pretending. He can't be that serious. And the, and the, and the boy was said he was very dejected. That why don't they believe me? You know, why don't they believe me that that is happening to me? Sometimes it's not a physical ailment. Sometimes our children are just going through stuff. And they just need us to just be there and just to listen. And many times we don't. But we need to have time for them. And that leads me to family meetings. You know, we need to have time when we gather together with our children to just have a conversation. When we did it when our children were young, the only thing we required was you have to be respectful. But you can tell us anything you want. You can tell us anything that we are doing wrong that you don't appreciate. Go ahead and tell us. Just be respectful. We're not going to take disrespect. But we're going to let you voice your opinion. And it was very, very well received. They love the fact that they can talk to us, that we allow them to talk and to speak their mind, and especially in this day and age. If you don't really call yourself and have a conversation with your children, many times you don't know what is going on with them. You don't know what they are going through if you don't take the time to actually ask them. You know, even all this pandemic that's going on, all these um, staying at home, doing school, whatever, how are you feeling? You know, are you getting this? Are you happy about this? You know, to get them to talk. So we need to connect more with our children emotionally, it's very, very important. And the last part, part four, is how do we stay as overcomers, even as a family of God, even as a community of believers? The early Christian church functioned as a family unit and they give support to each other. So there's three supports that I'm gonna talk about in this area, providing emotional support. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, the Bible says, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up on meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day appearing. So we're talking about giving emotional support to one another, motivating one another, praying for one another, being protective of one another, ministering to ourselves. The Bible also says in Galatians 6 to carry each other's burdens. And in this way, you fulfill the law of Christ. So many times we think we are fulfilling the law of Christ, but God is saying when we carry each other's burdens, we do that. Number two, meeting physical needs. In Acts chapter two, verses 44 to 46, we read believers had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give anyone who had need. They met together daily at the temple. They ate together in their homes with joy. And I'm thinking, I don't know anyone in this day and age who has sold their property. <laughs> so that someone can eat. So I'm thinking, what does Acts chapter two look like in 2022? What does Acts chapter two look like? 
And to me, it looks like meeting practical needs, having a community where people are free to let down their guards, where people are free to ask help from brother and sister without being judged, without someone talking about you, being able to go in and out of each other's homes if someone is ill, that I can go there and help them cook, helping with financial burdens if you can, mentoring across families. That means maybe one family has children who are doing well, they are all excelling, and then you have this family where the children are struggling to pull those children together so that all the children are doing well. Maybe you have single parents who need role models as fathers, doing all that together, looking out for one another's interests. I think when we do that, we can kind of simulate what Jesus is talking about in Acts chapter two. And number three, providing spiritual support, which is obvious. When we are together in the community of faith, we provide spiritual support. We help our faith to grow. Just as heat from a heap of burning coal increases as you add more coal, the same way when we are together, we increase our faith. Our faith grows. Others teach us, others hold us accountable. Um, we, we provide godly counsel to one another. If you are going to church with someone that maybe you know they got married five years ago, they still don't have a child, you know, you can approach them, pray with them. You don't even have to ask questions. Those are the kinds of things that we do together. We cannot go this journey alone. There's the story in Acts chapter 12 when Peter was in prison. Remember, James had been beheaded. And I think the church just felt like, oh, no, you're not taking Peter. And I believe they prayed with a vengeance in Mary's house, mother of John Mark. They prayed together. And God answered that prayer and sent his angel to release Peter. Those are the kinds of things that we, that we have together when we have a church family that is united. Those are the ways that we can be overcome as even against whatever adversity it is. Something as terrible as Peter being in jail and maybe he will have been beheaded just like James was. But because the church of God intervened, that did not happen. So in conclusion, for us as Christians, we must always be ready for battle. Before the pandemic, there was trouble. During the pandemic, we're having trouble. When this pandemic is over, trouble is not going to be over. Because Jesus says, in this world, we will have trouble. But as we, are, as we get prepared, prepare ourselves as individuals, prepare ourselves as couples, we prepare ourselves as families, and as a church family, if we are in the offensive against the enemy, then when the trouble comes, we are able to overcome and we are able to stand together. We are able to work together as a family, whether the family of God or your nuclear family, we are together as a family. We are not alone. And when we are in that mood, we are overcomers. So I pray that the Lord will help all of us as we have had these words, that we will take it to heart and that we will um, just receive all that God has given us to be able to meet any uh, adversity that may come our way and we'll continue to be resilient families even as we go through this pandemic and anything else that may come in jesus name amen 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 amen, amen. 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 thank you thank you sister tineke uh, i wish i didn't have to give you time but i Oh, yeah. <laughs> I wish I didn't have to give you time to stop at a particular time, but thank you so much for the rich message that you have given to us this evening. As I span through the participants, I see individuals, I see couples, I see family units, and I see church family. Mm -hmm. And your message has really touched every one of us and has told us that we have a part to play in overcoming adversities that come our way as individuals, as couples, as family members, and as church families. So thank you so much. And this will be the time that I don't see any questions on the chat. Um, so if you joined us late before we made the announcement, if you have any questions uh, for Sister Tunike this evening, any question, I, I uh, see a direct yeah. message, sis. I Is see it? a direct message to me, so let me read it. Great, thank you. What if a spouse, uh, 
what if a spouse life's principle in matters of responsibilities, I do it if I want to, I don't do it if I don't want to. Is this biblical? Mm -hmm. Can such principle help a marriage thrive? No, no, <laughs> no. Th this kind of attitude, I'll do it if I want to, I don't do it if I don't want to, no. It's, 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 it's not, it's not, you know, the Bible says esteeming each other better than ourselves. So by the time you are doing that, say, I'm going to do what I want to do. You are not esteeming the other person. You're not thinking about the other person. You're just thinking about yourself. Selfishness cannot be in a marriage. So, you know, that, that is, that's just a simple, simple response. No, it's not biblical and you cannot let any marriage thrive. No, that would be a mediocre mar marriage that's just swimming. <laughs> amen amen thank amen, you amen thank you thank you any other question that you see does anybody else have a question um you can raise your hand up oh, and, mute. uh unmute yourself and you will be recognized any question We have been charged tonight. We have been given um, tools to help ourselves and our families and our church family, someone around you to try to bounce back, to trust, try to thrive. And we have been told to choose. It's a choice that we have to make <laughs> to, to thrive. And it has to be meaningful we have to purposely we have to say that this is what we want to do for this to happen any other question, question that anyone has i have a question yes sir go ahead uh zillions emo my question is to the speaker how do you handle physical abuse where this husband beats up the wife and sits on her and does all kinds of negative things physically. Yeah. What do you suggest the wife should do? Okay. Um, well, the first thing I will always suggest is counseling because um, obviously the, the person, the man who is doing that definitely has a problem. Um, and, you know, I take the example from Jesus. When uh, the people gathered, the men gathered against Mary Magdalene. And they said they were going to stone her for committing adultery. Jesus came to her rescue and said, stop. Don't touch her. Anyone who's going to throw the first stone, see if you, if you, haven't, if you don't have this thing that I'm writing on, on the wall. I believe that if Jesus stood up for that lady and rescued her. I believe that if Jesus were alive today, he will rescue a woman who is being abused. If he didn't leave Mary Magdalene to be abused, he will not leave a woman today to be abused. And so if that man is not, I, I can't even imagine it. I have daughters who are married. I cannot imagine it for someone to do that to my daughter. So if someone is doing that and they are not ready to take counseling and change, then that person who is being abused must remove herself because she's a precious princess of God and she's not to be treated like that. And there are many negative implications in remaining in such a situation. I'm not saying divorce, I'm saying remove yourself so that he can get help because he definitely needs help. There are so many implications. When you stay there, and a man is beating you up like that, you can lose your life. I mean, it happens all the time. You can get to that. But when you lose your life, who's gonna be the mother of your children? And then for the children to be observing that is gonna have a lasting impact on generations. Generations. When I was a prosecutor, <clears throat> I would try some cases and, you know, during domestic violence, and the, the, it would be a child that will run into a closet and be calling 911. And I used to think in my mind, this maybe this is happening at 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. 
And in the morning, this child is expected to go to class and be a normal child in class and hear what they are saying in class. You know, it is so sad that a human being would take it upon themselves that they have the right to beat up a human being, a precious child who was raised in a home, loved by her parents and loved by God. It is totally unacceptable. Men who do that have problems and they need to seek help. If they are not willing to seek help, they need to be left alone so they can be living alone. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And uh, may I say something about this too? Um, it's always, uh, it seems that all the time it's assumed that it is the women, men that hit the women or beat the women. So many times it's the reverse. Mm -mm. Where the women abuse the men. Okay. Either physically, emotionally, so we see all this in the hospitals, in the hospital system. So it's not just the other way, it's both ways. It can be both men or women. That You're they, right. The data, the data is assumed because men are stronger. Men don't go to report most of the time to the police. Right. That's You're the right. problem. Right. Women do abuse men physically. You're right. You're right. Yes. The, the question was about men. And yes, it is true yeah. that women, women do that. And it's even, I don't, I don't even know, since a need of a man is respect, I can just imagine what damage that does. Even if you, even if the woman is not strong enough to do physical, I have encountered a lot of women who do a lot of emotional and a lot of verbal abuse. So either way, it's not good. I, I see a question directed here. Um, what role does the church have in addressing cross-cultural marriages? Individuals living here, going to marry someone from Nigeria and eventually leading to some failed marriages, given a high failure rate experience in our church. Um, I mean, th this is something that I talk about a lot. I know that there are situations where people have come from home directly and they have married people here and it has worked. I know that, you know, I know couples who have, but there are also situations where it has not. If this is going to be done, it will be something that has to be entered in prayerfully and with your eyes wide open. I am not comfortable to let any of that happen to my children <clears throat> because I went to college in Nigeria and there were so many men and so many women. And I'm just wondering how someone, a man is gonna leave all the beautiful women in Nigeria and it is my own child in America that you hardly know that you want. I'm just skeptical, like, why, why don't you see women? The place is flowing with women. And a lot of times it has been with ulterior motive. But like I said, it has worked, but we cannot be naive. If that is happening, you must know the person, you must know their family, they must have time to, you know, either the person comes here, the, the, the person here goes there. And with a lot of prayers, it has worked. That's why I cannot totally say zero, but we cannot be naive. We must be open in our eyes and in our ears, just in case, you know, why? Let me know, why are you doing this? And, and all of that. But only God can really, you know, only God knows the future, but it's, it's very delicate, very delicate. Thank you. That's a hand up, Sister Adhako. <laughs> Okay, that's me. <laughs> okay, my question is uh, on finance and the family. Yes, sir. If, if I make more money than my wife and I decide to keep my own money separate and my wife keeps her own separate, mm -hmm. will it affect how the marriage goes? Yes, yes. And you know... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, people, people can get away with that when things are going well. I know families that did that. And then at some point, so, so they had everything divided. You do this and I do this. And then there was a time that one lost the job. So if you lose the job, who is now doing your own responsibility? There was a time that, that, was a time that one of them fell ill, that they couldn't even work anymore. You know, again, as I said, when we do all that, we forget that we are human. You know, I know that different things work for different people. You know, some people put all the money in one account. Some people, yeah, they did. And then they say, okay, at least this is pocket money that I have so everybody can have their own. But to completely separate everything, it does not work. And you know, the Bible says that 
the two become one and they are naked. The naked is not only physical nakedness. It's nakedness in all areas. And by the time you are not being naked in that area, you can, your marriage is not optimum. You are not truly one. And, the, and it's not real intimacy. That's just the truth. Thank you. Thank you. I am going to ask one question on family <laughs> worship. <laughs> I have heard where um, a family that's challenging, they have challenging issues, maybe not at peace with one another. Mm -hmm. But during family worship, I'm told um, it could be it could be her, it could be he, it could be any one of them, and turns one person into to God, <laughs> like you're reporting that person to God. <laughs> so how do you encourage the next person to show up for that family worship the next time? <laughs> oh my goodness! Yeah, we need to be very careful. Even 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 not only with spouses, with our children, is the wrong time to be trying to correct them because. We want family worship time to be a time that they enjoy. You know, if we are going to discipline or talk about that, let us separate that from the time of family. Otherwise, they dread it. They dread it. And as soon as they are old enough and they are live home and they don't have to be a part of it, they don't want to be a part of it. So please, let us not do that. Let's all, that's a captive audience and we shouldn't do that. Let's find a different time to talk about our issues, you know, and... Uh, and God will hear us. Amen. <laughs> okay. I think we have five more minutes for question and answer. Any more questions? Any more concerns? <laughs> Any part that you want some light thrown? Sister, where is Brother Imo, your husband? He's hiding. <laughs> He's hiding beside me. I want to see your face. <laughs> I want to see your face, sir. <laughs> Show your face, sir. He's, he's hiding. <laughs> oh, hello, sir. Good evening. <laughs> Why are you hiding your handsome face now? <laughs> well, he was, he, he was, he says I'm the moderator, so he wasn't gonna. Um... <laughs> I was just behind the scenes. Uh, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you for your support. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay. Any more questions? Okay, uh, let's see. Oh, thank you, Bro Nathaniel, joining us from Dallas. Oh, <laughs> okay, so if we don't have any more questions for Sister Tineke, I think we will go ahead and go into our prayer section. And we purposely took off prayer request and testimonies this evening, but we will have an intercessory prayer for our families, our children, our church family. Um, so when we look at here, we have grandparents, we have parents, we have to be parents, and, and your parent at home, your parent in the church, your parent in the community. So we will ask uh, that Sam Wangwala, to take our marriages and our families to God in prayer, that we may be fortified and empowered to overcome ad adversity. Amen. Okay. Amen. Thank you so much. If I were to ask for a prayer request tonight, I know everybody would like to have a stronger family tonight at least. So let us go into prayer. Let's bow our heads as we seek the Lord in prayer. Our gracious and loving Father, our Father, we thank you for your word that has solution to all of our needs. Well, we thank you for our dear sister, Tinuke, who has come this evening to bring us a message of hope, message of gratitude, message of joy. 
message of resilience, believing that our marriages can thrive. Father, I thank you for the world that you have put in her mouth tonight. But I pray that these words will never go in vain tonight. As we, as families, look for solution to our, our needs and our problems. Father, may this be a part of our resource to dig and find help. Father, I thank you for what you have done in each one of our lives. I know that there are so many families tonight who are thanking God for the message that we have heard. I know there is a family tonight that is struggling because of a sickness of a loved one. I know there is a family tonight that is suffering because there's no food on the table or because the family member that brings the bread is sick. I know there is a family tonight that is suffering emotionally. Father, I know that there is nothing very difficult for you to reverse. I pray, Lord, that you bring your power from on high and touch each one of our families today. That any issue that we may be having, that we can pause and wonder and look at your grace and retract and do what is right before you. There may be a family that is at the verge of breaking up today. Father, by your grace, may a change of heart come. Father, give us the heart of flesh instead of heart of stone that has crippled many of our marriages, of our homes. Lord, I pray that you bless each one of us, even those who are striving today to find a solution to their marriages. Father, open their hearts and their minds and they see your words and come back and build a much stronger family. Even for those who are yet wondering if they will have a house together, Father, I know you can make it happen. So Father, I leave the families of this church in your hands today. That whatever that is missing, that you may fill it up that we may have a much stronger family than we have ever had before. That today will begin a, 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 turning, a new turning point in the life of our homes. Father, I pray for those who are even contemplating on putting families together, those who are single. Father, I pray that you reach out to them and touch them and that they put Jesus Christ in the front of them and put family together that it's possible that it's going to work. Father, I pray for our children, whatever they may be at this moment, because they are part of family. Father, nurture them, that we may all blend together and create a network, a network that can never be separated by the evil one. So Lord, I ask you tonight that wherever we have gone wrong, strengthen us that we may, we may rethink our ways. Father, we are striving to have a stronger church family. And we cannot do that if our families are fragmented. So Lord, I pray that you bind us together with the love of Jesus from our high. So that we remain as one unit, that you, your church will grow from strength to strength, that we'll be able to come accomplish the work of which you are putting in our hands. So Father, as we go to bed tonight, whatever may be our worries, Father, by the end of tonight and by tomorrow, may we have newness of heart. May bring each one of our families to a, a point where we can put God first in our lives. Father, I do not know who it is that can receive this message tonight and bring a change. I know that is someone. So Father, make that person, make them remember that you are there. 
to solve every problem. So Father, we ask you tonight that we may use this message and bring a change in our lives. I pray for our dear sister to get and her own family. Just as we have used them before, Father, continue to use them in this ministry. Because it's a needed ministry in our lives. Because if we cannot get together as a family, it is very hard for us to worship God. Lord, continue to bless them, bless them and strengthen them. And we thank you for the miracle that you have performed in our life, giving her long life because of this. For that bless her. And for anyone else who is struggling today in health, Father, grant them healing. Touch each one of us. So that when Jesus comes, all these troubles that we face every day, we will say, this is our God. We have waited for you. So Father, bless us tonight and grant us your mercy. For we are prayed in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We will walk out this town with a chosen hand from the young blood family. Thank you. Ed, I miss young blood. Ada, Mrs. Youngblood, you are, we can hear you. You hear us now? Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Sorry about that. We had a Bluetooth speaker on. We were just singing our hearts away. Let's start again. <laughs> Forgive us, please. You were warming your voices. Amen. Amen. Uh, SDA uh, 652, Love at Home. There is beauty all around when there's love at all. There is joy in every sound when there's love at all. Peace and plenty here abide, smiling fair on every side. Time softly, sweetly glide when there's love at home. Love at home. Love at home. Time softly, sweetly glide. When there's love at home, kindly heavenly from above. When there's love at home, on the earth is filled with love. When there's love at home. Sweeter sings the Brooklyn bird, brighter beams the azure sky. Oh, there's one who smiles on high when there's love at all. Love at all. Love at all. Oh, time to softly, sweetly guide when there's love at home. Jesus made me holy die when there's love at home. May thy sacrifice be mine. Then there's love at home. Save me from all harm or rest. 
with no sinful care distressed, through the tender mercy blessed, with death's love at home, love at home, love at home. Tender, sweetly, softly guide, with death love at home. Thank you, thank you, thank you for that beautiful rendition. Um, Sister Tuniki, before you do the benediction, our pastor, Pastor Emmanuel Abba, has been behind the scene. It is time for us to showcase him and for him to, to say a word. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Pastor, I just want to use this opportunity to say a very big thank you. Okay. to Auntie Tinuke for accepting this responsibility at a very short notice. <laughs> uh, we know you are very busy, but we thank you that you have always yielded when we invite you to speak. You. And you do this out of love, the love you have for God, the love you have for God's people. So we just want to say a big thank you. And you don't just teach by words, you are actually practicing what you teach, which is the greatest teaching that you can show to the world. So may the Lord bless you and your family immensely. Thank you very much for blessing us this evening. Amen, thank you. Benediction, thank you. Okay. I'm just gonna read from Jude 1, verses 24 and 25. Now unto him that is able to keep us from falling, and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be majesty, glory, dominion, and power, both now and forevermore, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let Amen. us know and obey this yeah. message that the Lord has given us this evening. That's, that's Amen. Amen. If you need her books, just reach out to me. I will get the names of the book. <laughs> That'd be great. Thank, Thank you. you very much. It's been great. My husband and I have been here before. Sometimes, yes. so yeah, sometime during the pandemic. Yes. Thank you. It's, okay. it's great to be back. God bless you all. Bless you too. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Bye. You. Good night. Good night, Good night everyone. everyone. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Oh